yourself. Happy Mother's Day to all of you who are, uh, are mothers. Those of you who have mothers, make sure you thank your mothers for, for them, what God has taught you in your life because of your mom. It's a special time. I'm not a big Hallmark holiday kind of guy, as I've told you, uh, much to my wife's demise at times. It's a burden she has to bear. I understand that. But today is a special day for those for all the ladies in our church, and so we're grateful for you. I do want us to take our Bibles this morning and open them uh, to Psalm 15. Psalm 15, I read Psalm 14 this morning, but I, wanna, I want us to spend some time in Psalm 15 this morning because, because where we have been studying in the Gospel of Luke over the last several uh, weeks and months, we have been hearing exhortations uh, from the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ concerning the desperate need for entrance into the kingdom. This this reality that all people without Jesus Christ are outside the kingdom, we need to enter into the kingdom of God, and there is therefore then an urgent reality that the door of entrance into the kingdom of God could be closed at any time. Remember in Luke chapter 13, Jesus clearly has shown us that reality. And so as we have been studying through the Gospel of Luke over the past several months, we have heard over and over again about faith, belief in Jesus Christ, that unless you believe what God has declared concerning His Son, unless uh, you believe upon Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul unless you turn from sin to God through faith in Jesus Christ alone, then the consequences will be an eternal price in which you will pay forever and ever in the horrors of hell. There is no other way. This is the only way into the kingdom. There is Only one way to have your sin covered, and as we saw last time, it is a narrow way. It is a narrow way. One cannot enter through some other way. The way into the kingdom of God is not through some kind of group entrance. It is a single file entry point. You must come alone and completely bankrupt of any kind of self-righteousness. You cannot bring yourself along with your deeds and your goods. The only way through that single door is by means of faith, enveloped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ as your covering. So there are not many ways, as false religions try to say. There are not Many roads to heaven. It is not that every religion is heading in the same place and will all inevitably end up at the same goal. That is not true. That is a lie. There is only one way, and it is through and in Jesus Christ. Any other attempt is a false way. It is error. Truth is narrow. Error is wide. This is what we constantly find happening with Jesus Christ as He is preaching over and over again throughout His ministry. He preaches the truth, and sadly, and not necessarily shockingly because of the wickedness of men's hearts, few believe. Many follow the road of error. And while Jesus was on the earth, the the grand perpetuator of error during His days was the same as it is today. It is, it is some means of unconverted religious talk. Religious leaders who are unconverted. Religious legalists who promote and teach a saving relationship with God through the keeping of various and differing rules of religion. Whatever religion meets your fancy, go ahead and do those things. And all those within that religion will say, you'll be okay with God. Well, in Jesus' day, this was the case. They were teaching, in essence, that the entrance into the kingdom of God was through the door of your own exercised religious practice, your own righteousness, a righteousness that was derived by you, something that you earned, a Jesus 
He came on the scene to expose that error, to uncover the foolishness of that error, and to reveal just who He was. The glory of God on display because He was God incarnate. Anything else is a damning error. And yet, out of the merciful grace of God, Jesus is given and He continually preaches truth which confronts that error. This is why people hate the gospel. This is why people turn their backs on those who are preaching truth. It's not because something may be wrong with that person per se. It's because truth confronts error. Error hates truth. And the truth of the kingdom is that entrance is only through the narrow way of Jesus Christ. It's only through His righteousness. It's not through Him plus you and your religious activity. In fact, I I mentioned it last time. I think it's worthy to read again. Isaiah 64, verse 6. Prophet Isaiah said to Israel these words, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, that is our sin, like the wind, takes us away. Our righteous deeds. uh, That's a pretty graphic term in the original language, meaning the, the... menstrual napkins for a woman. It's really not a pretty sight if we all think about it. And so we need to be made clean. We need to be made clean from the guilt of our sin in order to enter the kingdom of God. And that cleansing only comes by means of God's doing. God must, by His grace and mercy, envelop us in the righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ. And that only comes by means of His grace as He grants faith. All of that we understand as necessity for entrance into the kingdom. And because we've been talking about this whole idea of of being in the kingdom and entrance into the kingdom, I thought it would be profitable this morning to ask the question, what does a kingdom citizen look like? We understand that you can't get into the kingdom without Jesus Christ, but once in the kingdom, what does a kingdom citizen actually look like? And to answer that question, I I thought it'd be helpful if we went here to Psalm 15. Now, Psalm 15, in, in the original text, in the original language, if we had the Hebrew sitting here before us, you would notice that it has no title indicating when it might have been written. In other words, what the occurrence was taking place around the time when when David would have penned these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We don't know the occasion. So you can read commentator after commentator and get different ideas as to what might have been taking place. Some believe that it was during the time when the Ark of the Covenant was being moved to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem after the Temple had been built. It had had spent time, of course, not in the Temple because they were building the Temple at one point over years. And so some think that this was when this psalm would have been written. Because on that occasion, many believe that this is the reason for this practical question and then the, the answers given by way of division as you see it here laid out in these uh, five verses in Psalm, chapter 50, or Psalm 15. Because you notice that it begins here with a question in verse 1 and then the rest of the psalm gives the answer. And I suppose that on a practical level, it seems to deal with the evaluation, if that's the, if that's the occasion. It seems to deal with the evaluation of those who carry out the duty uh, of carrying the ark and then carry out the duties of caring for the sanctuary for the people of God when it comes to worship. And so if that's the case, this psalm then appears to be an evaluation of those who would carry out the duties in the temple. In ancient times, those who carried out the duties in the temple would have been the Levites. Primarily the Levites, they were the ones who, uh, we might even say they were the deacons of the church, if you could say that, before it was called church. 
In fact, David, in, in preparation for the time when the ark would be brought to the tabernacle, said this in 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 2, Then David said, None ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites, for them has the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. So this was their task. This was their duty. They were the men of God whom God had chosen to, to, to take care of the functioning of the temple and how it operated. So this, being a psalm of David, it would make sense then for those reading it to attach its teaching with those who were dealing with ministry within God's house. So on a, on a practical level, we might, we might even say as we look at Psalm 15 that this psalm is a, a practical evaluation for the leaders of the church. We might say that. And we could understand it with that mindset and look at, at it through that lens. But, but I, I, I genuinely believe there's more to it than that. I think this psalm is speaking to more than just the leadership in the church because I believe it has a wider view than that. I believe that it is dealing more with the character of those who are the children of God. All of us, as we have even been learning in our Ephesians study are ministers within the body of the church. And so I think there are principles here that we can draw out from it that, that deal with that reality. In fact, I believe that it's actually speaking to all of us here and asking the ultimate question of our day, a question that we maybe have asked in our own minds, who is the child of God? Who is the child of God? We might even ask it another way. What is the character of those who know the Lord? What is the character of those who know the Lord? Or, or what do those who abide in the house of God live like? Those who are part of the kingdom, those who are part of the family of God, those who are in the house of God, as we like to understand it to be, in the kingdom of God, what do they live like? The ultimate question in verse 1 is a question about godly living. It's not a question about how someone becomes a Christian. That, that's clearly delineated throughout Scripture by means of saying that you must repent and believe. You must turn from sin and believe upon Jesus Christ, right? That means you are turning from your own way, your own righteousness, and placing your faith in and trusting in what God said concerning His Son and about His Son and how His righteousness can cleanse you from all sin. So the first question isn't about how someone is saved. We know how someone is saved. So if the first question was, how can a man be found innocent before a holy God in the final judgment? The only answer is Jesus Christ, right? The only answer is by faith in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone, because it was all His grace alone that saved you. We, we, we would not find a, a list of outworkings in the Bible or actions for a person to accomplish and thereby enter into the, the household of God or go through the gate, as we saw in Luke chapter 13, or through the door, if you will. There is no such list. Salvation only comes by means of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. But here in Psalm 15, David's words are a question that directs its attention at what is the character of, in the life of those that know God. What is the character in the life of those that know God? Notice, O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? In other words, who may be there? Who, whose character is such that they, could, that they could be in your house, that they could be with you, that they could be on in the mind of David, surely thinking about what had taken place in the history of Israel, like Moses standing there and God says, take your sandals off, you're on holy ground. Who can be on God's holy ground? Who can be with God? 
that's the question. It's in a realistic sense, it's asking God, what is the character of those who actually know you? What character do you approve of? And so when we, when we look at this psalm and when we think about that as the question, we, we have to understand that in a practical sense, it's an evaluation. It's an evaluation of us. It informs us of the character of a Christian, a character of a child of the king, a character of a kingdom citizen. In other words, each one of us here who is a, a child of God who knows Jesus Christ by faith, everyone who claims a relationship with Jesus Christ, this is to be the outworking of our life. This is to be what we are like. This is to be our life. And in a perfect sense, we, we know. We're sinners. No human could perfectly fulfill this list. I mean, you look at this list and you go, there's no way. There's no way the demands of this text are far too high, far too great. To read it and assume that you can do it is to be self-deceived. Self-deceived. Why? Because none are able, just like we read in Psalm 14. None are able. There's only one who's able, Jesus Christ. There's only one who could accomplish all of it perfectly, and that's Jesus Christ. And so we have to say at the outset that unless one has a real relationship with Jesus Christ, unless one is genuinely a believer in Jesus Christ who fulfills all of these things perfectly, there is no practical hope for carrying out any of them in any kind of sense in our own lives. So this is a, a very evaluatory song. And it's a 12-part a self-evaluation. You were saying, man, I thought I'd come here for a nice peaceful message this morning. Well, you know me better than that. I know it's Mother's Day and we're supposed to be soft and flowery and pastel. But I'm just not like that. The Lord is just too kind to us to let us be there. So it's a 12-part self-evaluation, and it comes to us in six categories. Six categories. Each of those, of course, to make up the 12 parts, has two parts. But let me just list them for us, and then we can go through them as, as we evaluate ourselves in light of the good news of Jesus Christ, in light of the gospel, all that we've heard through our study of the gospel of Luke. The character of those who are God's children. We need to evaluate ourselves on these categories, these, these areas. One is your overall way of life. Your overall way of life. And you can get these as we go, but you can list them all if you'd like. Your overall words in life, that's number two. So your overall way of life. Two, your overall words in life. Three, your overall conduct toward others in life, your overall conduct toward others in life. Four, your overall ethics of life, your overall ethics of life. And then five and six, five being your overall integrity of life. And six, your overall approach to material things in life. So your way of life, your words in life, your conduct toward others in life, your ethics in life, your integrity in life, and your approach to material things in life. These are the six categories that I want us to just walk through this morning, looking at these 12 couplets, that, or these uh, couplets that we have here that make up these categories. Number one, your overall way of life. Notice what David says. He who walk in answer to the question in verse 1, Number, verse 2 says this, just in the first part, he who walks with integrity and works righteousness. Seems rather contradictory, doesn't it, in some sense, to the reality that we know you can't works right, work out any righteousness if you don't not know God. And here David is clearly saying then, evaluate your life in this because that is the outworking of those who do know God. Some of your texts may even say, he who walks uprightly and works righteousness, or 
he who walks blamelessly and does what is right. So these are dual qualities. Qualities of blamelessness and righteousness. They're they're two sides of one coin. They cannot be separated. You cannot just separate them out and, and deal with them both in separate categories at large. You can talk about them separately, but they are linked together. In other words, God's children are those whose lives are sound in character. They're blameless. That's what blamelessness means. Sound in character. And they are actively engaged in doing what is right. They live righteously. Blameless is the Hebrew word tamim. Tamim. It, it, it describes a person whose life is not one of vacillating commitments. Committed here today, but not committed to that tomorrow. We, we could even say it this way of the Christian. They are the same during the week that you find them on Sunday. For the genuine Christian, there's no parking lot miracles that describe them. They're the same during the week as they are on Sunday. What you see is who they are. What you see is what you get. Their pursuit is continually after the things of God. It isn't saying that they are perfect in everything all the time. No, certainly not. But they certainly are in a life in their life. They are pursuing the things of God in all areas of life. And when they fail, they run to God and seek that relationship restoration just as if they sin against someone else. And because of that, they do what is right. Or they, they do works righteousness as the psalmist has it here. So you say, well, what are those works of righteousness that ought to characterize us? What are they? Well, we get an indication of that over in Matthew's Gospel. If you want to just turn there really quickly, we won't spend any length of time there, but Matthew's Gospel, verse twenty or chapter 25, He says in verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. There's the the grand judgment of God in the final days when Jesus Christ comes to to set up his kingdom, and he separates out those who are his from the tares, or the sheep from the goats, or the wheat from the false wheat. Then the king will say to those on his right, that is the sheep, come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why? Because I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then notice their character quality. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? So so Jesus is saying, look, here's, here's the character quality of my children. Here's the character quality of the kingdom citizen. It's those that, that live in this kind of way, right? And verse 40 says, the king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, you did it to me. In other words, you lived like I did. You, you reflected my character to one another and to those around you, and it, it reflected my righteousness because that's the only righteousness you have. You lived like I lived. 
And of course, he says the very opposite to those who are on his left, the goats, those who, who may have attached themselves to him thinking they were good with God by their own works. And they're on the left. They're, they're not part of him. He, he doesn't know them. And he says, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. In other words, you're going to the same place that Satan and his angels are going. Why? Because of the same criteria. Lord, when did we see you hungry, verse 44, or thirsty, or stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, or not take care of you? And he will answer, saying, truly I said to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. All these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. There we get an example of what the psalmist is speaking to here in verse 2. He who walks with integrity and works righteousness. We could say, he who is like Christ. He was living like Christ. One man said it this way that I read, true believers do not cringe as flatterers do. They do not move about as serpents or crook on one side as those who have sinister aims. They have the strong backbone of the vital principle of grace within, and being themselves upright, they are able to walk uprightly. That's what God's children are like. God's children are like this in their overall reality. Their overall lives are characterized by these two twin qualities of blamelessness and righteousness. So we can say that if we are not positively serving the Lord, we're not positively or reflecting Christ, doing what is right to the best of our uh, empowerment by God, by His Spirit, then I think it is right for us to ask ourselves some serious questions as to the genuine reality of whether we know God or not. So why do you ultimately say that, Pastor? Because the Bible clearly tells us they will know us by our fruit. Jesus said they will know you by your fruit. So we must have in our overall lives this reality of integrity and righteousness. Number two, number two, the overall works or overall words of our lives, I should say. Notice what he says in the second part of verse 2 and the first part of verse 3, and speaks truth in his heart, he does not slander with his tongue. So you notice the first category is kind of an overarching category as to the reflection of our lives, as to reflect the righteousness of God because God has indwelt us and we ought to be living that way. If we say we believe in Jesus Christ, we say we know Jesus Christ, and we say we're in the kingdom of God, and that isn't the reflection of our lives, then we ought to ask ourselves a serious question about whether we actually know God or not. The second category deals with our mouths. And again, it's two sides of one coin. One side being what we are to do, and the other side what we must not do. So one side is positive, the other side is negative. What we do as God's children is we speak the truth. That's what he says. He's one who walks in the integrity of his heart, his works righteousness, he's like Christ, therefore, or and, he speaks truth in his heart. In other words, God's children, I like to say it like this, God's children tell it like it is. Now that doesn't mean you don't care about how people feel, you don't care about their own feelings. You only care about what it is. No, I don't want us to misunderstand this because by saying, tell it like it is, I mean that you you say what people need to hear, not what just you think people want to hear. Right? You speak truth. And truth here carries with it the idea of saying that which is correct and accurate as opposed to that which is false. The undiluted truth. In other words, when the Christian speaks, the words that we use are are something that others can count on. They can go to the bank with it. That is the truth. We're not shading it with some kind of untruth. It's trustworthy. It's trustworthy. 
In fact, this is why God uses this character quality, I think, to describe himself in his word so often. Just, just let me give you a little, just a little quick survey, really quickly, right? Our Bible tells us in John 17, 3, he is the true God. He's trustworthy. We can count on him. That's what he's saying. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, John 14, 6. The Word of God is called truth in John 17. Sanctify them in truth. Thy Word is truth, it says. And the Spirit is called the Spirit of truth, John 14, 17. All of those speak to the trustworthiness of God. That God is absolutely trustworthy in everything that He says because of who He is. So because He is absolute truth, he can be fully trusted. doesn't matter what he says. It doesn't matter how confusing to our pea brains it may be. We can trust it. And we can stand on it. And we can follow it. He can be fully trusted. And so his children are to be children who speak the truth. Again, this goes back to the idea at the very beginning that we reflect Jesus Christ. We reflect the glory of God. We are those who speak truth because our God is a trustworthy God and therefore our speech is to be trustworthy. And so that's the positive side, but on the other side, it is what we are not to do. He does not slander with his tongue. He does not slander with his tongue. By the way, you know what slander is? Slander is a form of gossip. Gossip sounds more nicer, even though we know the Bible says we're not to do that. But slander is just another form of it. Far too often, we join into some conversation or we begin some private chat about someone else. And it begins so innocently and quickly devolves into some kind of slander about them. I was looking up recently this word in the English dictionary. There are English synonyms for slander. You may not know all the synonyms for slander, but here are a few of them. Insult, that's a synonym for slander. Malign, slur, smear, vilify, disparage, defame. Those are all words for Slander and seek all of, or in in short, all of those words mean to injure somebody, to injure them not physically, but to injure them with our words. I don't know about you, but the more I watch our world, this seems to be the chief sin in our modern day, doesn't it? Slanders around every corner. What saddens me most is that oftentimes it's it within evangelicalism. Churches sometimes are filled with slanderous things. The more, I don't think there's been more damage that has been done to the church in our day to day than through the sin of slander. There are many, I would say, even in our group here, who have been the recipients of some of that unfortunate reality. God says here that his children bite the tongue before they would ever slander another Christian. You don't do it. It doesn't reflect the Christian. It doesn't reflect the children of God. At the very core of our being is truth. Not slander. Not defaming. Not vilifying. Not disparaging. And if we are to have the truth at the center of our lives, if, if, if it is such that we are to speak truth in our heart, then how in the world does slander come out of our mouth? Because out of the heart, the mouth speaks. It is from the heart that flow the springs of life. So, so if our truth is there, then certainly slander would not be there. And if slander's there, we are, we are deceiving ourselves if we're thinking that we have truth coming out. And I think if that's the case, it's right for us to doubt our interest in God and doubt our actual conversion. If that's the character of our lives, then we ought to ask ourselves the question, am I truly in a relationship with God? Again, why? Because we are known by the fruit of our life. 
This is what a kingdom citizen is. Number three. Number three. He says, our overall conduct toward others is to be different. Notice what he says in the second part of the third verse here. Nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. Our overall conduct to others is to be opposite of what the psalmist is saying here, right? Much like we saw in the characteristic just before this, with our words toward others, this one deals with our actions toward others. The second one was with what we say toward others. This one is how we deal with others. Again, a, a coin with two sides that cannot be separated. The first side is, is the proactive state of leading others in doing what's right. The other side would be the opposite of that. Right? It is a love for our neighbor more than ourselves. He, he, does nor, he doesn't do any evil to his neighbor. It reminds me of the words of Paul to the Philippian church in chapter 2 of Philippians. It's a wonderful section of Scripture that I think we would do well often to go back to it if we don't have it memorized and read it over and over again. I'll read it for us here this morning just so we have it in our minds describing the reality of our relationship with one another as a reflection of the, the attitude of our Savior, Jesus Christ, when He came to this earth. Paul says, therefore, in chapter 2, verses 1 and following, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion... And make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. And do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus who, although he existed in the form of God, and he did not regard equality with God a thing to be held to, but he emptied himself and he took the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient even to the point of death, death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul goes on, he says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, because it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure, do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be, get this, blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. I mean, you talk about an exhortation for the Christian life, there it is. No stronger words that, words that could ever be spoken and no greater example that we could ever have than the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who came and lived perfectly and reflected the glory of God even to the heinousness of the cross as He hung there. How we are to live a real love for others in that way ought to make us jealous for others' good, not their bad. A real love for others in that way will make us careful not to injure or corrupt their character. The sin with which we engage in our own life and then draw others into that sin is only a corruption of them, a lack of love for them. But when we reflect upon what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us and caused us to be in His family, that kind of reality will cause us to do only what will bring honor to His name 
and do nothing that might cause someone else to stumble. But let's be jealous for the well-being of others as Christians. And when we're like that, we won't be overly interested in the well-being of ourselves. Well, there's another side to looking out for others, not just simply not doing evil for a neighbor. But it's found on the other side of the coin here in verse 3. Nor does he take up a reproach against his friend. Take up, take up means simply to receive. That's the idea, to receive. And what's being received here in the context is information concerning another person. You're the recipient of it. You're taking it in. It's not simply helpful information, but rather information about some kind of tantalizing detail that, that only is, is interesting to you. It kind of goes back to the other idea of not speaking truth. It's, it's loving the gossip. It's slandering. These kind of things usually begin with words like this. Hey, did you hear about you fill in the blank? That's usually how it starts. Hey, did you hear about? That's the receiving end of the gossip line. It's sad to me that sometimes the fastest moving line of information within the church is the gossip line. But God sees it a different way. Just as guilt is the same for the accomplice as it is for the criminal, right? If you rob a bank, you're guy driving the getaway car is under the same penalty of crime as you are, even though you went in and robbed the bank? Well, so too it is with gossip. Right? The hearer is just as guilty as the giver. The receiver is just as guilty as the one giving it out if they do nothing about it. One old pastor said it this way that I read, the tail bearer carries the devil in his tongue, and the tail hearer carries the devil in his ear. I like that graphic. I think it would be great if all Christian people would be a people whose overall conduct toward others was for their best rather than their worst. Why? Because we're known by our fruit. We're known by our fruit. So the psalmist says he doesn't do evil to his neighbor. He doesn't take up a reproach against his friend. Number four, number four, the overall ethics of his life. It says in verse four, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. This is really an introspective, evaluatory look at what we, at what we value the most. What we value, what we treasure the most. It looks at what we approve of. And mostly it looks at who are our models? Who are we following? Who are our heroes? Who do you and I look up to? That's the idea. On the other side is what character and actions do you find offensive? What is it that offends you? And really it's asking what doesn't and should. The idea is what sin do you hate? Do you, do you actually hate sin? Because to love God is to hate what He hates. To hate sin. God hates sin. It's easy to say, oh yeah, I do. Yes, I, I hate sin. And yet we find ourselves following after people and things that are so ungodly at times. Those things that don't reflect the character of Christ in us and don't reflect it to others. That's what ungodly is. Things that don't reflect Christ. So each one of us has to look in the mirror and ask ourselves, who is it that I'm following after? And I think if we take an honest look at that, sometimes we'll be surprised at what we find out. We might just find out that the majority of our role models are not those who fear the Lord, but they're rather just ungodly people. God says, my children follow the upright. Right? That's what he's saying, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised. 
That doesn't mean you hate the sinner in the sense that you just hate people who aren't God's people. No. It is saying you, you don't want to admire anybody who's just living a reprobate life. I heard one pastor say, we've reached a point in our day where people would rather be envied than admired. They'd rather be envied for what they're, they're doing by way of their heinousness of life rather than admired for virtue. That's true of many, but it can't be true of God's children. We can't live like that. We are those in whose eyes a reprobate is despised. And we honor those who fear the Lord. We hold them in high esteem. It doesn't matter if the world likes them or not. It doesn't matter if it's popular or not. That's who we hold in high esteem. Those who want to honor the Lord, honor the things of the Lord. Why? Because we're known by our fruit. We're known by our fruit. Who's a Christian? A Christian is one who's known by his fruit. And so number one is our overall character. Two, our overall words. Three, our overall conduct. Four, our overall ethics or ideals of life. And then number five, our overall integrity. Our overall integrity. Notice what he says at the second half of verse four. He says, he swears to his own hurt and does not change. You know what that is? That's called conviction. That's called conviction. Now, there are people in the world who do not know God who have a conviction wrongly placed. But in the Christian, we are to have a rightly placed conviction. This is our integrity. This is the integrity of God's people. Well, we might even say it this way. No matter what it takes, we are to be people of the Word. No matter what it takes, we are to stand on the truth, even if that means it causes us ultimate pain, hurt, trouble. It's easy to be a person of your word when there's only advantage for you. It's easy to do that, right? The easy road is easy. That's why it's called easy. Right? But what happens when the conditions change? What happens when the weather pattern of, of the climate of society changes and, and now what you're standing on isn't so popular anymore? It isn't so helpful anymore. People are standing against that and you're finding that the crowd standing with you is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And even though at one point you may have to actually stand by yourself. Someone was asking me recently, why is it in the evangelical church that it seems like so many who have been faithful, who seemingly are faithful, seem to, towards the end, compromise and they aren't so faithful anymore? And my answer was, because easy is easy. Standing alone is hard. The best of men, the best of men struggle, particularly when those closest to them don't want to have anything to do with them if they stand on the convictions that they've had. And so they begin at times to sadly compromise. And so do we remain people of our word when the circumstances change to such a degree that if we keep our word, it's no longer going to be to our advantage. In fact, it may cost us severely. That's the question. God says His people are those who let their yes be yes and their no be no. They are people of their word. That just doesn't mean you'll do what you said you'd do. That means conviction. You'll stand on your convictions. And your convictions need to be squarely, soundly, and roundly standing on the Word of God, rightly divided. It was ironic. I was telling my wife about this this morning. The Olympics this year are in Paris. Well, they happened in Paris in 1924, 100 years ago. They were in Paris. And there was a man in Paris who was a good runner. His name was Eric Little. Maybe you've heard the story, Chariots of Fire. He was in the Paris Olympics in 1924. He was favored to win several races, particularly the 100-meter dash. But we know the story, right? Eric Little chose not to run that race because it was going to be held on Sunday. He had trained for years to run was the favor to win the 100-meter dash, and yet he chose not to run because it was held on Sunday. 
one of his fellow athletes, described his decision with these words. Quote, Little was the last person to make a song and dance about that sort of thing, he said. He just said, I'm not running on Sunday. And that was that. And he would have been very upset if anything much had been made of it at the time. We thought it was completely in character, and a lot of athletes were quietly impressed by it. They felt that here was a man who was prepared to stand for what he believed to be right without interfering with anyone else. I thought, wow, that's to be the heart of the Christian right there. That's our heart. right? Eric Little didn't win any, by the way, any of the medals for that race or other races that were run on Sunday in the 1924 Paris Olympics. Why? Because he was a man of integrity. He said, I'm not going to do it. That's the Lord's day. Integrity is essential, beloved, if we as believers are going to represent God and Christ in this world. Anything less than total devotion to Christ, any, any less devotion to the reflection of the character of God in our lives and our conduct only amounts to compromise at small levels, which will only become big levels. And none of that reflects Christ. Why? Because they know us by our fruit. We're Christians. And then the psalmist gives us this sixth characteristic here. Final characteristic found in the first part of verse 5. Our overall approach to material things or our overall approach to money. He does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. More than anything else, really, this verse speaks to what is behind our approach to material things. Not just the dollars you might have in your wallet or the bank account. What is here is what has to do with greed. It has to do with the heart sense of greed and how it can eclipse justice and how it can eclipse what is actually right. The psalmist isn't saying here that money should never or ought ever be lent at interest. Certainly there is interest that can be charged. In fact, the only place we see a prohibition in the Old Testament for interest was the Jewish people who were prohibited from taking interest from other Jews. And primarily it was those who were wealthy taking interest from the less wealthy. Taking advantage of those who had actual need. They would lend, but lend it at interest, even though they didn't have the, the need for the interest in their life at all. They were already wealthy. God said, You can't do that. If you want to study that, you can go to Deuteronomy 23, Exodus 22, Leviticus 25. So the issue at hand in each of those cases, in all of those passages, is that greed is the motivator. Greed was what's behind it. Greed was the motivating factor for the extraction of interest from others that you lent something to. Again, it goes back to the character quality, really, all the way at the beginning, thinking of others. right? This reflection of Jesus Christ in our lives, this idea of dying to self for the sake of the help of other people. And the second half of the verse is like the first half. right? He doesn't take a bribe. A bribe is an offense against justice. That's all it is. It's, it's greed from the other side, if you will. It's greed that corrupts the best of justice systems. I think we see that happening in our own country, don't we? What's behind the corruptness in our justice system even today is just greed. Greed for power, greed for position, greed for greater economic strides of their own life. The one who uses money wrongly and gets money by perverting justice is not a portrait of God's people. It's just not. If that's in your heart, then don't go around claiming Jesus Christ, please. The upright don't do that, it says. 
Those who abide in God's tent, those who dwell on the holy hill, don't do that. They don't operate like that. They don't think like that. Why? Because we are known by the fruit of our lives. This is what the psalmist is saying. We are known by the fruit of our lives. So who is the child of God? Who is that which enters into the kingdom? Who is that which the door isn't shut out? They're not shut out. Who is it? It is those who reflect His character in their lives because they know the Savior. They know the One. They have turned from their sin and embraced Jesus Christ by faith. It is seen in their lives. The character of God is seen in their lives. That's the character of those who live in God's house. And so the psalmist declares in verse 5, notice, he who does these things will never be shaken. He who does these things will never be shaken. almost seems like he's saying, okay, this is right back to works righteousness again, isn't it? But he's not. He's saying this is the reflection of their lives. They will not be shaken. The storms of life may come. The tempests of changing circumstances might blow around you. But nothing is going to tear you from the foundation of who you trust in and who you reflect. You're not going to compromise. This is the one who will dwell in the house of the Most High. This is the character of those in the kingdom of God. These are the ones who have entered God's house. Neither death, nor life, nor any other created thing shall remove them from His eternal love. They have been enveloped in the righteousness of Christ and it shows in how they live. It shows in how they live. The psalmist is clear. It's clear to the character of the righteous. Character of God's children. If you are God's, you may be shaken. But you will never be shaken loose. You'll never be shaken loose. That's the idea here. He who does those things, he's not saying trouble will never come, difficulty will never come. There may be those moments where where you're wondering about about who's who's standing with you. You're you're wondering if you're going to have to be alone. But you'll never be shaken loose. Because you're not holding yourself there. You're in Christ. And it's only in Christ that we enter that kingdom. Well, I trust that next Lord's Day we'll be back in Luke. I trust. We'll see how the Lord, Lord deals with us on that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the challenge to our hearts, for the glimpse into the reality of the heart of the psalmist here. All that was going on in the circumstance and the occasion, although we can't be dogmatically clear on what might have been happening. Either way, Lord, whether it be for the leadership alone or all of your people, the characteristics are the same. Throughout Scripture, these are clearly the characteristics of our Savior. We are to live as He is. Lord, let this be the evaluation of our heart today, not by way of discouraging, but by way of encouraging, challenging, shaping, molding. Use it in our hearts to to give us that motivating propulsion to live like you if we know you. And for those who do not, may this be that conviction upon them. May they hear it as the kindness of you that draws them to repentance. And may this day be a day of new life in which they turn from themselves, following themselves, and embrace Jesus Christ alone. We'll praise you for all of it because you are our saving and loving God. Thank you, Lord, this day, even today as we think about our moms. Thank you for them allowing us to be alive and to know you. To the praise of our Savior, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.